with an advanced radar and electronics bomb targets in poor weather and at night. Fighters like the classic F-4 Phantom defeated Hanoi's MiGs. U.S. aircraft operating from carriers off the coast of Vietnam shot down 59 enemy aircraft, with four more probably destroyed. But these successes came at a price. The U.S. Navy lost 530 fixed-winged aircraft, most of which had been carrier-based. Over 300 aircrew were lost in action, mostly to North Vietnam's extensive air defense network of missiles and anti-aircraft guns. And major accidental fires aboard the Forrestal and Enterprise cost over 200 lives and dozens of warplanes. Vietnam brought about a change in the composition of the carrier air wing. By 1972, all of the old Essex-class carriers had finally been retired. Now, the big deck carriers began carrying their own jet sub-hunters, in addition to their main force of offensive aircraft. In 1975, the first in a new class of nuclear-powered supercarriers was commissioned. The USS Nimitz incorporated many improvements based on experience gained in the operations of the Enterprise. Nimitz has become the standard US Navy carrier design with nine ships in service and the keel of a tenth laid in September 2003. These ships are of a similar general layout to the original Forrestal, but the latest examples are far heavier, displacing around 97,000 tons fully loaded. Nuclear reactors allow them to sustain a maximum speed of over 30 knots. In a 24-hour period, a supercarrier can easily cover over 800 miles. This allows them to be deployed very quickly potential trouble spots where the U.S. government wishes to maintain its influence. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, the carriers remained the most visible symbols of American power. But their air wings were still configured for Cold War nuclear confrontation. The vital role of carrier air defense was still being carried out by F-4 Phantoms, but these were being replaced by the swing-wing F-14 Tomcat. Their attack aircraft were improved versions of the A-6 Intruder and A-7 Corsair that had served in Vietnam. E-2 Hawkeyes provided airborne early warning. The supercarriers were configured for all-out nuclear war, but their ability to project American power at short notice saw them deployed for the more limited duties of peacekeeping, intervention, crisis management, and deterrence throughout the 1980s. Carrier battle groups were sent wherever American interests were threatened, from Nicaragua through Grenada in the Americas to the Mediterranean, the Middle East, and Korea. The attacks on Libya in 1986 saw the first combat use of the multi-role F-A-18 Hornet. Developed to replace the A-7 Corsair and the F-4 Phantom, the type has become the most important U.S. Navy combat aircraft. But it was in the Arabian Gulf that the U.S. Navy supercarriers were to see their first significant action. Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait threatened a major part of the world's oil supplies. Six carrier battle groups were deployed 
for combat operations during Desert Storm in January 1991. Their air wings struck at every kind of Iraqi target and played a key role in executing the successful air campaign that eventually ejected Iraqi forces from Kuwait. With the official end of the Cold War, America's military forces were dramatically reduced in size. But combat operations during Desert Storm only highlighted the importance of the U.S. Navy's supercarrier force, and it escaped many of the most drastic defense cuts. Still, the number of carriers was reduced from 15 to 12. Since the end of the Gulf War, carriers have played a vital role in enforcing the no-fly zone over southern Iraq. They've been used to support American interventions in hotspots as diverse as Haiti, Somalia, and the former Yugoslavia. Most recently, carriers have provided the base from which the United States has mounted its war on terror in Afghanistan and they continue to serve in Operation Iraqi Freedom. The supercarriers are hugely expensive. Each Nimitz-class supercarrier takes roughly five years to build and costs over four billion dollars. Then, there's the cost of an 85 aircraft air wing, at least another two billion. It needs a crew of around 3,200 sailors and officers with another 2,480 for the air wing. Such a costly investment needs to be protected. And this is why carriers never operate alone. They form the heart of a battle group and are always escorted by at least six other warships. These include missile cruisers and destroyers for air defense plus destroyers and frigates for anti-submarine defense. Very often, the battle group will also include a hunter-killer submarine. The carrier itself is a prime target, and it is protected by an extremely efficient layered defense system split into zones. The outer zone is protected by interceptors armed with long-range missiles. Airborne early warning aircraft detect enemy aircraft and missiles hundreds of miles from the carrier and direct fighters to intercept. The missiles of the carrier's escort ships cover the middle zone. Anti-submarine defense is provided by the carrier's subhunters, together with the helicopters of the escorts. Should all these fail, the carrier's inner zone is protected by close-in weapon systems. The carrier air wing is taking on a new shape in the 21st century. The aging Tomcat has been replaced by the multi-role F-A-18 Super Hornet. This will be the Navy's premier combat type for at least the next 20 years. It will be joined in the second decade of the 21st century by the carrier variant of the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter and both these new types will be deployed on the next generation of supercarrier, CVN-21. CVN-21 will have totally new systems in almost all areas. Such increased automation will reduce the size of crews, cutting operational costs considerably. Less than 100 years will separate the CVN-X from the USS Langley. In that time, the US Navy carrier has evolved from its early days as a scouting force for the battle fleet via its war-winning performance against Japan and its crucial support of American forces in Korea and Vietnam into the nuclear supercarrier, the most powerful warship the world has ever seen. The ship's flexibility and its ability to project power globally remain unmatched. These capabilities come at an astonishingly high cost. 
and it is a price that the United States is willing to pay. Only the U.S. has the resources to build and maintain a fleet of 13 such vessels. And that's why the U.S. Navy will continue to dominate the world's oceans for the foreseeable future.